So welcome again, everybody, to this webinar this afternoon uh, to meet the Smart Nanotox project. My name is Claire Scantleberry, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. The webinar is intended to take about 60 minutes, and we hope that it's an excellent introduction to the Smart Nanotox project. The webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to listen back on YouTube after the webinar, and we will send everybody the details to access that. As a quick introduction before we hand over to uh, Vladimir as our first presenter, as I said, this webinar is, will last up to 60 minutes, and we have two main presenters today. First of all, we will have the introduction to Smart Nanotox from Vladimir Lobaskin, the coordinator. And then we will move over to Ulla Vogel, who will introduce the Smart Nanotox work within the adverse outcome pathways. We will keep participants on mute during the presentations to ensure the best audio quality. But after each presentation, there are opportunities to ask questions. You can either use the chat function inside the webinar control panel, or we will unmute people and you can just ask a question directly. As I've already mentioned, the webinar will be recorded and all registered delegates will receive a PDF version of the slides. So thank you very much indeed for joining us today. And I'm going to hand over now to our first presenter, who is Vladimir Lobaskin. So while I am undertaking the high-tech ICT to transfer over to Vladimir, I will allow him to introduce himself and get started with his presentation. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you, Claire, for introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Vladimir uh, from University College Dublin. As Claire said, I'm coordinating Smart Nanotox projects. Uh, I will uh, start with the overview. Uh, we are uh, a project funded by European Commission within Horizon 2020 program, and the uh, it's a it's, it's the, the category within which we are working is a topical call on increasing the capacity to perform nano safety assessment. So we're a relatively large project on that scale. Uh, we are, have overall funding of 8 million euro and duration of uh, four years. We include 11 partners uh, working on uh, various aspects uh, of the problem. And uh, the, the partners are all listed here. You see the logos. Uh, that includes several academic institutions, universities like Imperial College, uh, University College Dublin, University of uh, Lorraine, Stockholm and uh, several uh, national institutes for occupational and environmental safety and the Finnish, Danish, uh, uh, then the French and German. Uh, and also we have uh, two companies on board, uh, Vitrocell and Dassault Systems. So I'll outline their roles uh, later on. Uh, for the starting point, when the, this call was formulated, and uh, actually we answered to uh, this uh, challenge with the proposal, was a, a state of the art uh, several years ago in uh, attempts to predict toxicity of nanomaterials. And it is especially challenging for new materials. So if uh, something uh, is produced uh, anew uh, using new technology, using new uh, substances, new, new chemicals, then of course we want to know whether this uh, material is toxic or uh, dangerous uh, before it, it goes to use into production. And the starting points uh, at that point were uh, the limited capacity to predict hazard for new materials, uh, because uh, actual relationship between the material properties and, and uh, particular hazards have not been identified. The attempts of the previous years to predict uh, hazard directly uh, using molecular level descriptions uh, basically failed. So the systems were too complex uh, for that. But also on the other hand, uh, on, the, on the larger side, so uh, the uh, typical uh, toxicological measurements uh, quite often overlook the systemic responses. So the, the challenging were on, on two sides. Then uh, to connect the two levels of description, like biological one and the physical, uh, physical and chemical descriptors, uh, we, we need to understand the interface, the, the region where 
uh, these two types of materials, like nanomaterials and biological tissues, come in contact. And uh, at that point, we realize that by nano interface is really poorly understood. We, we cannot say anything just looking at the uh, chemistry of the material, whether uh, it will be dangerous or not. And then uh, other challenges are listed here, dosage and nanoparticle state after uptake is not known. And that, that uh, was especially emphasized uh, during several years of research at uh, UCD, a uh, group of Ken Dawson uh, worked on a protein corona and, and found that it, it's especially important for those interactions and for outcomes, toxic outcomes of nanomaterials. And finally, uh, another starting point was that many in vivo, in, in vitro toxicity endpoints traditionally measured like the EC50 uh, on cell viability are not really predictive of uh, long-term and, and chronic outcomes like uh, cancer or fibrosis. And therefore, uh, we, we put it uh, in this way. So we say that standard characterization of materials, these chem properties is not sufficiently informative, so it cannot be useful predictions. So therefore we need to advance uh, that part. And on the other hand, we need to advance our understanding of uh, the toxicity mechanism, mechanism of action on the biological side. So here, uh, uh, our basis for, for the new approach is the idea of adverse outcome pathway, and it outlines the mechanistic understanding of toxicity. What, what you see here on this diagram is a, a different levels connected to each other, uh, different levels of interaction. So nanomaterial, through its properties, it interacts with the individual biomolecules and parts of the uh, uh, tissue. Those changes, those interactions, induce changes at the cellular level and activate certain signaling system or perturb uh, certain sig signaling uh, cascades and pathways, which leads to uh, responses and damages at, at the organ level and so on. So you know, on the right-hand side, the blue boxes, they address the biological part of it. and the uh, this orange box uh, actually covers the FISCAM properties, and they meet in between. So this part in bio nano interactions is where two kind of description, physical, chemical, and biological meets. So this was our concept. We, we decided to cover both and uh, connect them at uh, the interface. So to simplify the picture, you see now, if we analyze adverse outcome that Ula will uh, tell you about in, in much more detail. If you know the pathway, what happens at the biological level, uh, you should be able to identify key events or initiating events, molecular initiating events uh, uh, for the particular materials and uh, for particular uh, pathways. Then those initiating events like uh, membrane disruption, uh, for example, interaction with certain protein production of reactive oxygen species, could be connected with the nanomaterial properties. So our approach is as follows. So we want to characterize the material exhaustively in, at the more advanced level and connect uh, those uh, descriptors with the initiating events rather than uh, final adverse outcomes. And this we consider as a, a feasible problem. So our most activity is concentrating uh, about this point where this chem uh, part, this chem description and biological description uh, come together at the level of key events and initiating events. And for that, we need to understand by nano interactions. So uh, project objectives are formulated as follows. So we are not trying to solve all possible problems. We are very focused. Uh, in, in this sense, we have a project team that is uh, expert in, in pulmonary respiratory exposure and adverse outcomes. So what we want to go for is uh, identification main uh, adverse outcome related to uh, inhalation of uh, airborne uh, nanomaterials and identify main toxicity pathways leading to adverse outcomes uh, for lung uh, at uh, the level of lung and, and the whole organism. Second thing, we want to establish relationships between these chem descriptors of nanomaterials properties, and they need to be advanced as well, as we saw before, uh, and uh, key events. In that case, we should be able to predict the outcomes uh, based on these chem descriptors of nanomaterials. Then 
On the way uh, to that goal, uh, we are going to produce a database of bionano interactions. We want to characterize them quantitatively, say how each property of a nanomaterial uh, influences the state of biomolecules it, it gets in contact with, and uh, uh, tissues like membranes. And then uh, finally, based on this, uh, we aim to design a smart screening approach where we could test only for initiating events or key events and those specific properties identified that can be correlated with those uh, and make a, a economic uh, test that uh, certainly will be not be based on uh, in vivo measurements. So we designed the test based on in vivo predictions, but the tests themselves would be in vitro or in silico uh, tests addressing crucial bionano interactions. So that, that, that's the plan. Our projected impacts, what we promised and what we're working on now, are uh, validated and described uh, respiratory adverse outcome pathways. Then database of binary interactions for uh, over 60 nanomaterials. And nano interactions, uh, nano bio interactions will be with the proteins, lipids, uh, sugars, membranes, and so on. So any uh, components of the uh, tissue, especially lung tissue with, the, with which nanomaterials will be in contact uh, initially. Then uh, uh, identified properties of concern, mechanism aware toxicity assessment tools. So this uh, tests that, that we are going to design uh, will be based on uh, knowing the uh, exact mechanism of action. Then uh, finally methods for uh, nanomaterial tracking. I didn't mention that before, but th this is essential. We, we need to be able to see what happens directly after uh, first initial interaction, initial contact. And finally, a replacement of animal experiment by in vitro in silica tests. I will now go in, in more detail what uh, kind of group of groups of stakeholders and, and potential consumers we address and our main outcomes. So one thing that we're going to uh, produce in the end, uh, QSARs, the statistical models uh, for predicting toxicity. And this uh, can be used across the board. They can be used for uh, regulation, uh, certainly to, to do the fast screening of, of new materials. Uh, then they can be used by other projects. We are now interacting already with several uh, EU projects on, on that and uh, US projects as well. That can be used for training. So we uh, prepare uh, PhD students and master students and uh, also the undergraduate students sometimes at our host universities uh, for that. And industry and commercial application, so QSRs could be integrated in commercial product like uh, in the salt systems uh, QSR workbench. Then we also do on the uh, molecular modeling simulation potentials has also great uh, potential for uh, exploitation. So it, it can be used in research and in the industry, also for modeling materials. All, uh, one of the industrial products, commercial products that uh, is interested in, in that and company that is interested is uh, Material Studio from the salt. Then simulation models also can be integrated in commercial uh, products, but, but also will be available through open source uh, codes and, and simulation codes uh, themselves. So to be more specific, we expect many of these outcomes to be available uh, in, in the coming uh, two or three years. So some of them are already available. So if you look at the, at the bottom, our uh, project webpage, Smart Nanotalks EU, so we post there, uh, most of these outcomes already. To be more specific, first, at least those that uh, can, can be used in, uh, for academic research. It's a description of respiratory adverse outcome pathways. Ulla will tell you more about those. They're initiating events and key events. Gene expression profiles, we do a lot of omics uh, using in vivo samples for in vivo respiratory exposure. Then uh, air liquid interface systems to imitate realistic exposure conditions. That can, can also be used for research purposes uh, as well as for industry and regulation. Then uh, novel uh, protocols for inference of gene regulation networks from the omics data. So we have this expertise in the project as well. So we uh, 
try to identify uh, new uh, mechanisms and new uh, pathways based on omics, not only based on databases and identification of core regulatory genes. Then, uh, sorry, I switched uh, too fast. The demonstration of equivalence between rat, mouse, and human models. We have the first signs of that it could be possible in, in certain cases, and we, we have the mapping uh, for that. Uh, then uh, I, I should mention as well the uh, particle nonparticle tracking uh, in tissues. So we have uh, several novel nanomaterial labeling techniques that allow, allow us to use the labeled materials for in vivo exposure and uh, track them after that in, in the tissue samples. Then uh, protocol for corona analysis. We also advanced the, the existing ones, and, and we believe our protocols are uh, most advanced in, in this case. Uh, algorithms for image analysis and colocalization of nanoparticles and biomolecules like lipids. Uh, and and uh, also the, the uh, dyes, the, the fluorescent dyes. Fingerprints for uh, corona-based nanomaterials. Uh, sorry, for, for uh, fingerprints for, for nanomaterials uh, based on, on analysis of protein coronas. So we should be able to say uh, what uh, uh, kind of proteins, what kind of biomolecules uh, stick better to each particular nanomaterial. And by that, we, we characterize the nanomaterial surfaces and reactivity. Then nanomaterial tracking techniques, post uptake characterization data, uh, coarse grain force field that relates to simulation, molecular simulation for 30 materials, uh, multi scale simulation tools for bio nano interface like protein absorption on inorganic surfaces and nanomaterials, uh, descriptors of nanomaterials like a band gap, reactivity, hydrophobicity for, uh, we, we designed about 30 descriptors for 60 materials. And uh, we also present the data for those. Some of those are already available and database for bio nano interactions. For industry and regulation, we, we have uh, to, to deliver a novel mechanism aware testing strategy. So we are planning to demonstrate its viability of this strategy that we can I predict something based on pathway analysis and testing only for initiating events and key events. Uh, as well for air liquid interface systems for realistic exposure, demonstration of mapping of inhalation and installation. So if uh, the test can be replaced by installation, for example, inhalation air test, uh, that would be an advantage as well. Equivalence between models that I mentioned already. Novel toxicity endpoints bound to in vivo adverse outcome pathways rather than in vitro cell viability. So our analysis and predictions are all based on in vivo uh, events and in vivo exposure. In vitro assays, targeting, initiating events and key events. Then uh, for particular materials, the, I, I never mentioned materials to work with. It, it's a range of metal oxides and, uh, and silicates uh, that are important for industry. And, a wide range of carbonaceous materials, like carbon nanotubes, uh, uh, graphene, carbon black. So we are going to uh, identify the, the properties of, of concern that are related to hazards. Then uh, basis for grouping of nanomaterials by their ability to trigger specific adverse outcome pathways. Uh, basis for read across and safety by design. And then uh, uh, QSARs that are based on knowing the mechanisms and finally, again, the database of nanomaterial properties of bio nano interaction. Uh, just uh, I, here, I, I just list uh, the methods uh, that we have in the project and the expertise. And uh, that you, you can see in more detail also on the project website and uh, in our brochures. So we have a variety of molecular simulation techniques, starting from ab initio, at atomistic, and uh, mesoscale, where we can model everything starting from hydration of, of specific uh, surfaces to uh, nanoparticle protein corona and uh, uh, cell uptake. We have a variety of methods for in vitro exposure, a liquid interface, uh, uh, then submerged uh, cells and uh, other techniques. We have uh, methods for in vivo exposure, inhalation and installation, and uh, 
uh, unique techniques for aerosol preparation. Then we have air liquid interface systems. So here you see the uh, vitrocell six well system uh, with the, for which we design very accurate and realistic uh, uh, exposure technique. Then we have omics and systems biology analysis that we process variety of transcriptomics, uh, proteomics, and lipidomics data and derive the, the protein uh, for the gene regulation networks that, that you see uh, below the, the graphs for those networks. And then we also develop nanoparticle, nanoparticle tracking and post-uptake characterization techniques that are also outlined here. Uh, combination of fluorescent and super resolution optical techniques to uh, identify and localize uh, particles very precisely. So uh, by this technique now, we, we see where the particles, is, for example, inside the lysosome or outside the lysosome, that we have uh, a much uh, precision in, in these respects. And, and finally, what I wanted to show you is uh, uh, the, the list of the adverse uh, outcome pathways we are uh, addressing, like uh, lung cancer, fibrosis, apistosis, chronic inflammation, cardiovascular effects, and a couple of more that we identified uh, ever since. And uh, you, you see how it works. For each of the pathways, we identify the key events, and those are serve, uh, serve uh, as candidates uh, for in vitro and, and silico tests. So the, the uh, things on the right we're trying to predict, and things on the left are used uh, uh, to make a predictive uh, tests and those things will be related to nanoparticle FISCAM uh, descriptors. So some of the key events, candidate key events like lysosomal destabilization uh, or oxidation cell membrane or rust production uh, can serve for that purpose as well. And the, the, the final uh, test, like uh, example of in silico test is outlined here. So we, we start with the descriptors of biomolecules and, and nanomaterials. We can bind those to predict the corona, and then we uh, use the prediction of the, of the uh, uh, protein corona to uh, predict the initiating events. Like in, in this particular situation on this graph, you see prediction of uh, cell association of uh, nanomaterials based on the interaction with, with protein. Here we use the literature data with our final tests uh, will look uh, like that as well. So we're on the way to produce them. So I'm done. I'm, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thanks very much, Ulla. Great. Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Ulla Vogel and I'm um, part of Smart Nanotox and I will talk to you about Smart Nanotox and the AOPs. Um, so, okay, so uh, nanoparticles in air can, or we can be exposed to nanoparticles in many ways. We can inhale them, ingest them. They can uh, come into skin contacts in cosmetics and we can be exposed to them via uh, medicine containing nanomaterials. But smart nanotox will only focus on inhalation of uh, nanomaterials. And uh, inhalation of particles is known to affect health and this um, knowledge comes mainly from uh, from uh, research in air pollution. And one of my favorite examples is uh, this uh, natural intervention study from Ireland, where um, heating with coal was banned for private households in 1991 due to high levels of air pollution. Um, this intervention was very effective, as you can see on the graph on the uh, to the left upper left, where you can see that the level of black smoke decreased by 70% as a result of this ban. Um, and then um, health outcome or mortality was assessed after, before and after this intervention. And in the, in the uh, graph below, you can see that all-cause uh, mortality decreased by 6%. So people live simply 6% uh, longer after uh, the reduction of air pollution. And these um, estimates were adjusted to the death rate of the rest of Ireland to account for time trends. You can also see uh, to the right that the pulmonary death decreased by 15% and heart-related death 
which is mainly cardiovascular disease, it decreased by 10%. So this simply shows that exposure to particles have a huge influence on mortality. So the vision that we work from here is that we want to have safe use of nanomaterials, including high volume nanomaterials, which can be, for instance, uh, white and black pigment, which are used in tons and tons throughout Europe and throughout the world. So to be able to do that, we, of course, we need to have an evidence-based risk assessment and we need to be able to predict the toxicological effects based on the information uh, about the physical chemical properties of the nanomaterials, which are often uh, the only information that is available. And for doing that, we need to have a mechanism based on understanding of the toxicological effects. And in the Smart Nanotox project, we use the approach to use AOPs to delineate those the, the mechanism of, of action um, of the toxicological effects. And we aim to design assays for, uh, in silico and in vitro for, for testing the toxicity. So the information that we gain from this can be used for grouping and ranking for regulatory purposes and for safe by design approaches for innovation. So grouping and ranking is, uh, or grouping is the understanding of which material can be grouped together and regulated as one group or one item. Um, <clears throat> for instance, different uh, types of titanium dioxide nanoparticles with different sizes or different shapes or different surface uh, modifications. And ranking its understanding of are there any of the materials that are more hazardous than others and are there some that are not hazardous at all. So safe by design um, is it that if we can identify the properties that will drive toxicity, then um, innovation um, or you can design new uh, new products without the hazardous properties and then find, uh, develop safer um, nanomaterials. So when we inhale particles, um, they will deposit in the airways depending on the size of the, of the inhaled particles. They can deposit in the upper airways or in the lower airways. So here in the figure to the right, you can see um, the deposition pattern of particles, including nanoparticles. So uh, on the x-axis, you have the particle size, and on the y-axis, the deposition uh, percentage of the inhaled particles. So large particles primarily deposit in the uh, head region, so <clears throat> in the nose or in the upper airways, whereas the nanoparticles, which are the particles between the size of 100 to say 10 nanometers, primarily deposit in the alveolar region. This is the deep end of the lung where oxygen is taken up and carbon dioxide is, um, is excreted. Um, and this makes a huge difference to how fast the particles are removed from, from airways again. So here we zoom into the alveolar region um, and when fine particles are inhaled, they will deposit in the upper airways, in the bronchi and the bronchioles. And here we have small ciliated airways. Um, and the mucus cellular escalator here will transport the particles up into the throat, where we will, and then we will swallow the particles and they will be removed from the lungs and go through the, the GI system. So this clearance happens very fast within, say, 24 hours. The few particles that will reach the alveoles will be removed by macrophages um, <clears throat> that will take up the particles and um, remove the particles, for instance, by, by taking the um, mucocellular escalator up and be cleared away. When we have the nanoparticles in the example to the left, many more particles will reach the alveoles. So they will be present in the alveoles and they will overwhelm the macrophages. So the macrophages will be like Cinderella. So if the macrophages 
of the Cinderella has to pick piece up of the ashes and it takes much longer time than if it was a, a football she had to remove. So the particles will simply be present for much longer time and the presence of foreign objects will initiate a foreign body reaction, which is the inflammation, which will result in attraction of inflammatory cells, um, neutrophils and, uh, and lymphocytes, uh, the release of pro-inflammatory mediators and um, generation of reactive oxygen species. And all these reactions uh, contribute to uh, toxicity and development of disease in humans. Just to give you an example um, of the effect, here we have an example here where we mice inhale titanium dioxide nanoparticles so they inhaled um, 40 milligram per cubic meter of titanium dioxide for one hour daily for 11 days. So the daily dose that these mice inhaled was half of what a Danish worker is allowed to be exposed to according to the occupational exposure limit. Um, <clears throat> so these mice inhaled less than a Danish worker will, would do in the same um, time period. Then we measured the accumulation of titanium dioxide in the lung tissue of the mice and calculated the, uh, the, the deposition and estimated the remaining uh, material. So five days after the last exposure, we could um, find 24% of the deposited particles that were still remaining in the lungs and 25 days after last exposure, uh, we, we could still find 21% of the deposited particles, just indicating that the nano-sized particles were deposited in the lower airways and were cleared away very slowly. Then we <clears throat> looked at the inflammation generated by um, by the, uh, as a consequence of the nanoparticle inhalation. So uh, here we have three types of cells in the, uh, the lung fluid when we wash the lungs uh, of the mice with saline water. And we looked at macrophages, which are the cells that remove uh, foreign objects, neutrophils and lymphocytes, which are the inflammatory cells. <clears throat> the hatch bars represent mice that inhale titanium dioxide and the, oh, the white bar represent mice that, in, uh, mice that inhaled um, filtered air. And um, you can see that five days after inhalation, um, I'm sorry for this. You want to get the phone? <laughs> no, I can't, <laughs> but I can't find out how to stop it. <laughs> So the mice that inhaled titanium dioxide uh, had increased influx of neutrophils, so they had a clear inflammatory response, and the lymph uh, and also an increased uh, presence of lymphocytes, so indicating a, a clear high inflammatory response. After four weeks, we could still see a strong inflammatory response in terms of uh, increased numbers of neutrophils. So inhalation of nanoparticles will induce inflammation. Um, and this is part of, of uh, the known health effects of nanoparticle inhalation exposure, uh, where we know that all soluble, insoluble nanoparticles will induce dose-dependent inflammation. Um, inhalation of particles is also linked to cardiovascular disease, fibrosis, lung cancer, and um, Inhalation of certain nanomaterials will also induce uh, acute lung toxicity. Uh, and these are, are um, adverse outcomes where smart nanotox will de uh, develop adverse outcome pathways. So um, adverse outcome pathways are um, structural representations of, um, of biological events. Um, and how they will lead from adverse effects or to adverse effects. And they are considered very relevant for risk assessment because they are the causal relationships. So here we have a, 
key mo uh, uh, molecular initiating event. Um, uh, um, and, and then we have different key events that are uh, causally uh, related to each other, leading to the adverse outcome. Um, and the key event uh, relationship um, describes the causal relationship between the molecular initiating event and the first key event, and the next and the next. Uh, so the presence of one key event does not necessarily mean that the adverse outcome will come in the end, but it, it is a possibility and usually it will require more and more material to progress from one key event to the other. So all these key events and the molecular initiating event will um, represent targets for in vitro testing and for modeling. Um, so Smart Nanotox has already finalized two AOPs and um, I will show you the two AOPs uh, here. So the first AOP is developed by Sabina Halapanava at Health Canada and it is um, submitted to the uh, AOP Wiki as AOP 173 and describes how in inhalation of nanomaterials uh, can lead to lung fibrosis. And here you see the mole uh, molecular initiating event which is interaction with uh, resident cell membrane components that will lead to um, increased uh, pro-inflammatory mediators leading to uh, increased recruitment of pro-inflammatory pro cells. So here's a pro-inflammatory response leading to influx of inflammatory cells uh, leading to loss of alveolar ca capillary membrane integrity and this will lead to activation of type 2 T helper cells causing fibroblast or myofibroblast proliferation leading to uh, deposition of extracellular matrix which is lung fibrosis <clears throat> the second um, AOP that smart nanotox has developed um, is AOP2 Three, seven, which describes how secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, can lead to plaque for progression, which is atherosclerosis, I'm sorry. Um, and in this AOP, we have a, a molecular initiating event, which is the censoring of the stressor, here the nanomaterial, to the pulmonary cells. This leads to uh, increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines which leads to key event 2 increased production of acute phase response protein SAA serum amyloid A uh, serum amyloid A then becomes uh, or translocates and become incorporated into HDL lipoprotein uh, in systemic circulation and this leads to increased formation of foam cells which leads to atherosclerosis and this AOP was de uh, developed with Sarah Suss Paulsen as main author. So the smart nanotox ambitions are that the, um, to submit five AOPs to the OCD AOP sponsorship program and as I said we already um, submitted these two and they can be found on the web page and um, with more details. The next step of course is that once we have the, uh, the key events and the mo uh, molecular initiating events is to design in vitro assays to monitor these and to um, develop t tools that can predict um, the, the nanoparticle interaction with the biological membranes and proteins to predict the key events and the molecular initiating events. So this is all I have to say. I would like to thank you, you for your attention and acknowledge the contribution from Sarah Suss-Paulsen and Sabina Halapanava. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks very much indeed, Ulla. That was an extremely interesting presentation. So again, I would like to ask if anybody has any questions from the uh, delegates in the webinar. No, that's fine. I have a quick question, which you may already have explained during the presentation. But in your key event pathway, and you talked about higher doses of nanomaterials being need being needed to initiate uh, the sort of later um, key events. Would that be? Could that also be? Um, could they be initiated through longer exposure to lower doses, or is it specifically higher doses of the nanomaterial that they need to be exposed to? Um, yeah, I think that's a very good question, actually. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in the event that if, if you have longer, do longer exposure to lower doses, if you have accumulation, then you would automatically de automatically mm -hmm. end up at having higher doses. But I think the the idea is that you um, that if you need higher levels to trigger the next step, then uh, it is not automatic. You will not automatically automatically go from the one key event to the next. But then you, ha you just have the possibility of triggering the the next um, level. So I think that the the dose needs to be higher, and that higher dose can either be obtained slowly over time, or it can be a rapid one time higher dose. Yeah, and it was very interesting about the slow, the slowness of the lungs to clear titanium dioxide because you still had an immune response after four weeks. And I was, I just yes. wanted to ask if that was f after four weeks of exposure or four weeks after exposure had finished. Four weeks after the last exposure. Oh, interesting. So it is very slow yes. to, uh, to clear. Yes. And, and and even uh, for carbon nanotubes, uh, there is a, a well, or one of the first inhalation studies actually showed that there was still inflammation half a year after last exposure. Wow, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting occupational health question for the handling of nanomaterials. Yes. So that is really great. I, of course, you are still welcome to ask any more questions before we move to our final wrap up, if anybody would like to say anything. No, they're still all very quiet. So I would like to thank Vladimir Ula very much indeed for a very interesting and clear introduction to the project and to the fascinating work on adverse outcome pathways. And certainly it would be very interesting to see a lot more nano-specific adverse outcome pathways being published to go along with work in more nano-specific regulatory aspects and allowing researchers and producers to be much more focused on how they develop nanomaterials. So you can keep in touch with Smart Nanotox in a number of ways. The website is updated with latest results and uh, publications. You can also contact Vladimir or uh, use the follow the Twitter account for at Smart Nanotox. We do plan to have more webinars around specific aspects of the project in 2019, and we would certainly let the attendees of this webinar know um, so that you could also get involved there. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much indeed to everybody that attended. We will share the slides and also the recording of the webinar. And once more, we say thank you to Vladimir and Ulla for their excellent, excellent presentations. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope that was a useful uh, webinar for you. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.